Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting from the Jazz Standard here in New York City. Tonight, performing music from her brand new record for her official New York record release party here at the Jazz Standard is saxophonist, flautist, as well as clarinetist Anat Cohen. Her latest CD, Luminosa, is on the Anzic Records imprint, and she really, really, really goes in a very musical direction that's against the grain, which she's always done throughout her career. Tonight we sat down and we talked about this brand new recording. We talked about what took so long for her to put this recording out, as well as talk about some of her major musical influences. As you might know, Miss Cohen grew up in Tel Aviv, Israel, and she has very, very, very eclectic music tastes, ranging from Brazil to straight ahead jazz, as well as hip hop, as well as electronica. We also sat down and talked about the importance of Sidney Bechet and John Coltrane in her career, and also talked about how she was exposed to the music growing up in Tel Aviv. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Miss Anat Cohen and her quartet live here at the Jazz Standard. It's part of her official New York record release for Luminosa here on the Pace Report. Thank you for sitting down with me this evening here at the Jazz Standard, and congratulations on your brand new recording. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for coming all the way to the Jazz Standard in this very snowy day. And uh, yes, I'm very excited about the new album. This album is called Luminosa, and this record really is, this is your seventh as a leader. It's your first release in three years. and. It officially comes out on March 17th, and what you're doing on this record is this is really kind of an inspiration from the great Milton Nascimento. Um, yes, it is. Uh, that was the 
what I've been wanting to make a, an album for a while, but um, you know, the idea of making a whole Milton Nascimento album, I, it's been on my mind for a long time. And then we did a show with the quartet at the end of uh, 2013. And um, we did all Milton Nascimento songs. And you know, the music has so many elements. And then I thought, you know what? Let's use Milton as an inspiration for the sounds, for the uh, for the directions, for the for the music, for the landscape, for the you know whatever the mu his music represents, and let's just add other colors and and let me put some of my own originals and so it all started with the Milton uh, Nascimento tribute and became you know quite Brazilian but not really Brazilian album. This is a really funky record of yours. <laughs> this really is. And I say funky in the sense that you are covering a Flying Lotus song on here. And you, you really did kind of push the envelope a little bit on this. Yes, I guess so. You know, it's uh, I have in my band, I have uh, my friend and my, 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 my colleague, uh, Jason Lindner. And Jason, for every, ever since I met him, he's been... Uh, hipping me to new things and to you know and and he you know it was his suggestions to do this song which i would never thought of like doing a flying lotus so song and he said hey you know i really like this song check it out and i was like how can we do that and then we just figured out you know how to, you know it just it works and it's just really fun to play so so you know i don't know if pushing the envelope is the 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 description but uh it's just i like to to take something conventional and you know, be myself. Be a little bit unconventional. You know, not Brazilian music is really not outside of your box anyway, because everybody knows your love for the music. And, you know, I, I have to ask you this, because, you know, you're bringing so many different dynamics from the clarinet and the saxophone and the flute to your music. How does this all work? Hmm. You know, I think the the main thing that that uh, that I keep in mind that really directs me is, is uh, are the melodies, and and you take a song and I hear something or I play a melody that just stays with me. You sometimes you know those melodies, that just just strong melodies, and and I have an affinity for melodies. So I think um, from from any kind of influence and any kind of music that I ever get to play those eternal melodies, those songs that just, they stay with you and then they become part of my language and part of the melodies I, I, I yearn for. So I think it's all uh, somehow, and then of course there's the rhythm, but that's for the next question. <laughs> you know, two of your big, big influences, and we're gonna go into this just a second, John Coltrane and mm. Sidney Bechet. And both of them are diametrically different, but they're diametrically the same. Because when I see you perform, especially with the clarinet, I see you doing a lot of Coltrane. But also, at the same time, you're keeping the rich tradition of the clarinet as far as jazz from the beginning of how this music evolved. Wow. Thank you for, uh, for saying those things. This is really cool. Um, you know... We're talking again about about uh, inspirations, and you know, I was just you know listening to um, who I listening to the other day um, on the radio. Ah. You know, it's the the idea of uh, of of imitating somebody is is for me. It's 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 almost an impo it's an impossible mission. Like you cannot be somebody else. You are who you are, and the, those influences of Train and, and Bechet, uh, it's, you know, you can, you can transcribe the notes that they played, but there's something that is beyond the notes, and, you know, listening to Train, I mean, the, the spirit is so strong, and, and I don't know if it's, some, it's something that you feel. You know, you can analyze and you can say, okay, place those notes on these specific chords and you can imitate the phrases, but you can never be another person. And, and what I take from those two that you mentioned is like fire, this like passion. 
And the people that influence me and that, that stay with me, they are the, the passionate musicians, the people that they give it all, they just, they, you hear it in every note and every essence that they, they play. So it's, 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 they're connected, Train and Bechet. You're right, because you know, every time I listen to Crescent by, by Train, it's just, it means that record, and even Love Supreme, and there's some other things I can go on about my uh, 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 Coltrane. They mean the same to me now than the first time I heard them almost 20, 25, 30 years ago. Yes, because it's the spirit behind the music. And, you know, when I, I, I remember listening to Crescent. You know, I'm not, I'm not a, I cannot say I'm a religious person, but I had that, that ex an experience of, like, listening to Crescent and just, just feeling, you know, something that is stronger stronger than us it just took me to a whole dimension and you know i i don't know how to describe it but you know crescent is is deep it's a deep album <laughs> about the origins you you hail from Tel Aviv and mm -hmm. I want to know because your family is so very musical your brothers and yourself you guys have been doing this I guess since birth tell me how the clarinet came into your psyche you know I think uh, we had we had a clarinet in the house my dad bought it in Paris I don't know really why he never really played any instrument officially, and he bought this clarinet on one of his trips. I think he found it very cheap, and he had it, and he could put it together and play a few notes, and 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 I just, you know, he showed it to me, and I was like, cool, man. I, I, when when it was the time to study musical instrument, 
you know, I was like, cool, clarinet is cool, I can do that, let's, let's try. And, um, you know, the musical family is something that I have to make a, make a point out of because, you know, yeah, you have people that, uh, that grow up with, you know, supportive parents and some people are not lucky to have their parents let them play music or, or encourage them to become musicians. They usually say, why don't you get a real job? But, um, you know, we were really lucky, the three of us, my older brother Yuval and uh, my younger brother Avishai, to, to play music and have uh, two wonderful parents to just say, you know what, that's what you want to do, we'll pay for the lessons, we'll drive you around like crazy and, uh, and, and, and let you play music. And it's something that, an experience we shared and sharing music at home, sharing music with my brothers, it's just that uh, it was so precious and uh, really, you know, people ask me, you know, about my path and I'm thinking, I don't know if I would be here without them because you have uh, something that you just do in the family and you, we all of us, we just play music and, and I never think I'm a, I'm a girl, they are boys, I should play, I belong, I don't, be. it's just, it's just something we did and, and, and they were passionate about it and and I was passionate about it, and our parents let us be, and, and I am grateful to my brothers and grateful to my parents for letting me just be. Was there always this sibling competitiveness about the music growing up, or was it just, okay, I'm listening to this, I'm playing this, let's get together? Because the, the, there are the three coins. You guys perform together as a unit. You know, the, the, uh, there wasn't competition. It's interesting because, you know, we were really, really young. So at that point, a year and a half difference or three years difference between one sibling to the other, it, it really is a big, it's a big difference. And, you know, kids don't play, the kids that are, you know, 10 year old, they don't play with kids that are seven year old. They're like, they everybody doing their thing. So we kind of got used to everybody doing their thing. So there wasn't really much competition. There was support and of course, you know, at this point, we each lead our own life and, and we have different musical, you know, path and, and different kinds of bands. And, you know, the, all of us, the three of us, we love the, the tradition of jazz and we love the music of New Orleans. We love Louis Armstrong. And when we go on stage together, we just, we find a common thread and how to, how to bring the music that makes us the happiest. Growing up in Tel Aviv, how were you exposed to the rudiments of the music? Because coming from your country, another type of music has evolved and has evolved all over the world. And learning the American music, how was that? Was it hard? Was it easy? Or are you still adapting as a progressive musician that you are right now? Oh, definitely adapting. I mean, I think at this point, you know, this question, you it's almost you, you can ask, this question, how does a young uh, kid from, from Tel Aviv get into jazz? And you can say, how does a young kid from, from Tulsa get uh, gets into jazz? Because there aren't enough clubs and there are. It's not music that people keep going around and you can hear it outside and they play it on the radio. So today, when you're a young kid and trying to, to study this music, you have to be active about it. So we were active about it. And you have to meet the right people that gives you inspiration. Um, which we, we had wonderful teachers that were definitely, you know, giving us the love. And you have to have some access to data. And either some, when we were kids, people that give us tapes or, you know, records. Or, you know, today, luckily, there's internet and people just get a hold of uh, information that way. So I think, uh, I think just uh, some institutions, education, and uh, definitely... You know, it's a community. Jazz uh, has been and, and is and, and, and I think will always be a community. So people that love this music, they, they want to share it. So we were lucky to meet people that love it and share it. Anat, coming to the United States, going to Boston, a little institution by the name of Berkeley. Mm, little. <laughs> also known as the Berkeley Empire. The Berkeley Empire. Was that a culture shock for you musically because yeah. you were, you were interacting with musicians from all over the world who were competing pretty much for the same piece of pie to learn some from some of the best instructors you know it's interesting uh, you know the two things yes there was a culture shock 
definitely. Mainly a language barrier. I was not comfortable speaking English, and I still I'm working on it. Um, so there was the English, uh, the language barrier, and then there's the the feeling, you know, the f the the culturally feeling part of the, you know, the American culture is is close to, in many ways, to Israel, but it's very different. We are Israelis are a little. You know what? I'll, I, I'm not gonna say it. Cause I don't wanna. <laughs> but I, I would say I would say people of your country are very, very traditional. They're very of the tradition. Whereas America, uh, Americans, we're from, they're different, different nationalities and backgrounds from all over the world. And when they get here, they're either going to continue their tradition or they're just going to adapt and become Americanized. Right, right, and you know, in some ways, you have to become Ameri you you become you Amer you get Americanized because this is a, you know, you the 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 feel of the music, the feel of jazz, the the way people are, the way the language sounds, the way people play, the certain flow, it it's all connected. So you have to become part of the of the culture to understand the music, and it's the same. For America, for North America, it's the same for South America. If you want to go to Brazil, you, you better, you know, speak Portuguese, figure out the rhythms, the language, of the, it's part of the music. And it's the same in, in every country. So, so you, you adapt, you, you, you adapt and you, you take whatever you, you, you take and what, what you can digest. And, you know, and for the longest time, for example, I said, okay, I got to work on my American accent. And p then somebody says, listen, there are plenty of people that speak with American accent. You know, it's okay to to you have an accent. It's fine. I was like, all right, then I'll have a I'll have an accent in, in everything I do. And and you know, but for the music, it's 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 an ongoing pro process. This is uh, you never you're never there. You always there's always another stage to go and another many steps to go. So I'm just the beginning of my process. <laughs> As I was coming up listening to jazz, my grandfather, God rest his soul, and my grandmother, there were eras of the music 
the big band, mm. Dixieland, and we moved to the big band. And then the clarinet was really a big part of the early part of American roots music and jazz. And when I think of the clarinet, I think of guys like Woody Shaw, Benny Goodman, Sidney Bechet. But also I think of 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 the, the, the clarinet is from the Ellington band, uh, Bernie Bagard. Mm. Uh, I think at the beginning when this music was, was in the forefront, the clarinet was out front. What do you think happened from the clarinet to the woodwinds going to like the saxophone? Towards like the late 40s, 40s up into the 50s? I think, uh, I, I think the music just got more complex. And apparently clarinet is a difficult instrument. Yeah. Like the flute? Nah, different, different. The technicality of the, of the, of the, of the clarinet is a, little, is a little tricky. And the, the more complex the music, the more chromatic it is, the more you know, hard to, to execute uh, lines. And I think uh, in that uh, finger-wise, the, the saxophone is much easier. And uh, I think it just was just a good exit for people. They want out. But beside that, I think the other, the other part is the clarinet. You know, it has a really wide range. The instrument is amazing. I mean, you can play really, you can, you know, hail on those high notes, or you can play these beautiful low notes. The problem is that when you play, you want to play the beautiful low notes with the band, nobody can hear you. And as the music gets lighter, louder, and there's amplifiers, and the clarinet is a hard instrument to amplify. People just, I think, they slowly just, it's lost its place in bands. I think. I don't know. There are probably other reasons that I don't know about. But, you know, I think this is kind of two things that just m make sense to me. The, the, the difficulty of the music and, uh, and, the, and the amplification of the clarinet. The challenge in it. So, you know, now it's, uh, it's back. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. Reporting from the Jazz Standard here in New York City, I'd like to personally thank the talented Anat Cohen for her time, also the staff and management here at the Jazz Standard for their warm hospitality. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. Thank <laughs> you.